Now, now keep your fingers there um, in James 1, but I would like to start in the Old Testament with a very well-known fact that happened in the life of King David. So please turn with me to the other spot in the Bible, 2 Samuel 11. 2 Sam Samuel 11. And I'm going to refer a lot to this event in the Old Testament, um, but you will recognize it the moment you see it. It is the story of King David and Bathsheba. King David and Bathsheba. I'm going to read a few verses there, um, starting with, with verse 1. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab, his general, out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. And one evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. That was why she was bathing. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. Now we know what happened afterwards. David killed the husband because he could not get him to have intercourse with his wife so that it seems as if he would, if he was, he would have been the father of, the ch of that child. And after he killed the husband, he took Bathsheba as his wife and the baby boy was born that did not live long afterwards. But Verse 27 to Samuel 11. The thing that David had done displeased the Lord. It was sin. So the Lord sent the prophet Nathan to confront David with his sins. And what was David's response? God, you know, it's actually your fault. Um, yeah, you made Bathsheba way too beautiful. And, and you could have stopped me that day. I mean, why did you have to wake me up so that I could walk on the roof and, and see, this, see this woman bathing there? Um, um, why did you allow her to take her bath that time of the day when I was on the roof? And, and you know, Lord, how weak I am around beautiful women. Was that his response? No. Once he realized what he had done and what the, what the prophet Nathan pointed out, he cried out in verse 2 Samuel 12, verse 13, I have sinned against the Lord. Take note. He had sinned. He fell for the temptation. He took responsibility for his sin. It is so easy to point the finger at God when we are under a trial. Adam did it. It is the woman you put here with me, he said to God. Now, the readers of James' letter were mostly poor, extremely poor people, and they were persecuted from, by the Romans, by the pagans, by the Jews. Not very popular people. And it seems as if they were also tempted to do some faith compromising things to get them out of out of their situations now they might have been tempted to to get the easy way out when there was no money maybe to sell one of their kids into slavery or themselves into slavery just to get money maybe they were tempted to compromise their faith by joining a pagan guild the guild of the shoemaker so that they can at least sell their shoes in that city where they were staying um, or maybe they were tempted to renounce christ and be accepted by their kinsmen the jews themselves or even maybe to just go and pray once to caesar so that they can have all those wonderful privileges of Roman society. The temptations were there. They were in a very severe and difficult trial where they had no money. When one can think that these things were very real temptations for them. 
what we pick up between the lines in James' letter is that in that in in those situations they started to question God. Kind of. Why have the Lord allowed me to be in this in this hardship? Did I sin? Is he not a God of love? Is he not sovereign in control anymore? Directly or indirectly, they pointed the finger at God like Adam did, saying something like, Lord, you put me, you put me here in this situation. And now that means you are responsible for my temptations, and that's why I'm going to take things maybe in my own hands to get me out of it. What was James' advice to them? In that situation where the, the trial was severe, they were tempted to get out of it in their, maybe their own strength, their own ways, their own schemes, started to question God in all of this. What was James's advice to them? And therefore his advice, the Lord's advice to us when we are undergoing trials. Now let's read James 1 verses 13 to 18. But I'm going to start in verse 19. Not to be silly, but many, many commentators and uh, of, of this letter thinks that the first part of verse 19 should actually be part of verse 18 and there's a reason for that so for, for, for the sake of that just see the logic of it verse 19 reads my dear brothers and sisters take note of this let's stop there take note of what that's why they think it's part of the previous few verses take note of what I have just said what did he just say it's also interesting to, to hear those words take note of. In verse 12, he wants people to think, to, cons to consider. In verse 2 also, to consider. And here he, he says a thing like, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. It is as if James is in this, in this first part of this letter constantly, or not constantly, but every now and then telling his readers to think correctly about their trials. To think correctly about themselves, to think correctly about God and his work in them through trials. So, what did he say? Verse 13. Take note of this. When tempted, no one should say God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So far the reading of God's word. What did James want his readers to take note of in their trials where they were tempted in various ways, one way definitely, to say that God is responsible for their situation. Verse 13. Take note of this. Remind yourselves that God does not tempt anyone. God does not tempt anyone. He does not put a, a test on our path so that we will commit a sin. He is not the author of temptation. How do we know? We know it because God cannot be tempted. It cannot entice him to, to unholy behavior. E evil is not part of him. He is holy and pure. He, he cannot be affected by evil. He is insusceptible to it. God does allow trials, yes, in our lives, like he tested Abraham and Isaac, but never with an evil intent. He does not try to seduce us to act wickedly. Why not? Because he cannot act wickedly. It is totally against who he is. His character, his perfection, his holiness, pureness, goodness. So, neither Adam nor David could ever blame God for falling for those temptations that they were in. Why not? Because God cannot be tempted by evil and therefore he does not tempt 
anyone. So remind yourselves of this when you're in that situation. God does not tempt anyone. So who must take the blame? Who must take the blame for David's sin then? Who must take responsibility for us falling into temptation and sin? James's answer, God's word saying, we must. That's the second thing we should take note of in verse 14. Remind yourselves that you are enticed by your own evil desires when tempted. But each person, verse 14, is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. There is no blaming of God. There is no blaming of Satan. That, that's also a popular one. Blame Satan. Let's chase out the demon. There is no blaming of your upbringing or your friends or the government or your genes. When you have fallen into temptation and you have sinned, just yourself. Just me. That is the case for each person. That's how James starts that verse. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away. There's no exception. That is the case in every temptation. No exception. James places the responsibility for giving into temptation and the resulting sin squarely on the shoulders of each individual. So we cannot point the finger to God in this. It's rather pointing a finger to ourselves. And James even gives us a, um, a metaphor to explain how this happens. Actually two. The first one is this. Each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire. Now this image comes from hunting. Where the hunter would lay out his snares and if an animal steps into it, it will get caught and the hunter would drag his catch away against his will, kind of. But drag, drag his catch away and go and eat it. That's how we are dragged away from God's path into sin when we fall for temptation. The other metaphor is it comes from, from fishing. Maybe that's a, a better one that we will understand here in Walfish Bay. It pictures the, that's the entice part, where evil desire um, entices us. It, it pictures the, the angler skillfully casting his bait where the fish are. I know that's a strange place to find at our coast these days where the fish are. <laughs> But that's the idea, to cast where the fish are so that the fish are enticed to come out of their hiding places and to inspect the bait and to take it and becomes sushi. That's the idea behind this. Remind yourselves, take note of this, James is saying, that you are enticed by your own evil desires when tempted. Being dragged away by our own evil desires, enticed by what we see as, as pleasurable and beautiful, sets of a fatal sequence of events. In our minds, in our hearts, and in our actions. Which is the next thing that James wants them to take note of, and us to take note of. Verse 14 and 15. Remind yourselves of how temptation works. Remind yourself, I call it the MO, the modus operandi, and the terrible end of falling into temptation. When you go to war, this is something that, that, you, that you will know, or when you go into a, a big match that you have to play, one of the things that that they will tell you is you have to know whom you are playing against. You have to know their weaknesses. You have to know their strengths. When you go to war, you have to know your enemy. You have to, to know its thinking, its modus operandi, how it works. Know its ugly footprint when you see it. Recognize its workings. And that will help you to deal with it effectively. So what is, if we, if we, if we dissect temptation... What will we see? What is the modus operandi, the ugly footprint of it that we should recognize immediately when we see it and flee from it? Well, James breaks it down for us. In verse 13, 14, he already implies the first step in this, in this um, temptation sequence of events. You are enticed. There is an attraction. 
You won't do things if you are not attracted to it. Remember Genesis 3 with Eve? Eve saw that the fruit looked good and was, it was attractive to her eyes. She had been drawn in by it. So much so that she didn't think any further and couldn't remember what God had said about it. David was attracted to Bathsheba. He saw her bathe and, sh and, and he saw that she was beautiful and he wanted her. There is that external attraction that is laid up for us all around us in this world, by the world, even by Satan himself. He lays out the bait for us that attracts our attention. The next step is the one in the totally wrong direction. We are dragged away and enticed by what we see. But each person, verse 14, is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. So there's the attraction, then there is the dragging away and the enticing part. What happened to David there on that roof when he saw Bathsheba? David was carried away, lured in his thoughts to what he perceived as, as very beautiful and someone he had to lay his hands on, someone he had to have. He was dragged away by his own evil desires. Now when the sinful mind is presented with an attraction, it wants, it will start to fantasize about it, it gets carried away by it, and it gets dragged away from God's path. It wants to explore, it wants to experiment, it wants to experience what it sees as so wonderful and enjoyable. And it dreams of wonderful images of joy and pleasure that are simply irresistible. This is the point where the mind becomes preoccupied, consumed with the thing or the person it finds so attractive, where it gets dragged away and enticed. Next step, conception and birth. Then after desire has conceived, verse 15, it gives birth to sin. After the attraction, David got drawn in by Bathsheba's beauty. He got enticed in his mind and his heart by her. And what was the next thing he did? He set up a plan. He set a plan in motion to get what he wants, what he wanted. Can you see the sequence, sequence of events leading further and further away from God where it started off with an attraction the mind got enticed by it, dragged away by it and the next thing there's a plan in the head to enjoy this thing that you so much want after desire has conceived it gives birth to sin David set a plan in motion to enjoy what, what he saw as very beautiful and enjoyable. He, he sent messengers to get, to get Bathsheba and she came and I don't think it was to sing her his most favorite song on his lute. He had laid with her. He had intercourse with her. And what is that what we should see in the sequence of events here? Desire had conceived. A plan was in motion. It was already in motion when? In David's own head. And the result of that was, he set it in motion, and sin was produced. Or as James put it, sin was born. And if that sin is not dealt with, if that sin is not confessed, if, if we don't go to God and confess our sins and deal with it, with him through Jesus Christ, it will grow up, it will fester, and it will give birth to a grandchild, an even worse one than sin, the child that was born in the first place. That grandchild's name is death. Verse 15, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it's full grown, it gives birth to to death. That's the last part of this sequence that James points out to us 
so that we can see the workings of, of temptation and when we know how it works to flee from it and stay away from it. The last one is death. The final result of sin is death in the separation from God, physically, spiritually, eternally. Physically we die because death came into the world through Adam's sin. Spiritually we die and because when, even when we are saved, there is some kind of distance that we create now between God. There is a sin that needs to be held with. But if not, if we don't deal with that, spiritually we stay in a situation where we are totally separated from God. God let Adam and Eve leave the garden. There, there was no intimacy like there was before when He walked with them and talked with them in the garden of Eden. That was lost because of sin. Sin leads to separation from God. And if it's left to grow up, if it's left to fester, if it's not dealt with in Christ, it will lead to eternal death, which is the second death, which is hell. If we do not repent and put our faith in Jesus Christ, sin leads to that ultimate separation from God called the second death. That is what we should see with regard to the MO, the modus operandi of a temptation. And where it ends, we should see what is at stake, what we stand to lose if we give in or if we do not repent of our sins and leave it in the hands of our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. What else should we take note of when we are in that situation where we are under, under a trial and we are tempted to think it's God that placed us there and, and He's the one that must now sort this thing out? Um, it is his, he, He's the guilty one in, in all of this. In verse 16 and 17, James points us to the goodness of God. He already told his readers that we cannot point the finger at God in such a situation because God cannot be tempted. That his perfection of, of who he is, his goodness, his holiness, won't allow for that. Now he goes back to that and focuses on another perfection of God which won't allow for evil, which won't allow for him giving us bad gifts, which won't allow for him to tempt us through laying certain things on our path so that we must or can sin. His goodness. Verse 16 and 17. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived by the, the external beautiful veneer of a temptation. It's deadly. And do not be deceived about God's role in your trials. He does not tempt us because He's perfectly good. God is good. He, he's not the author of evil. He's not the author of temptation or of sin. And, and therefore God's actions towards His, his children are always good. Romans 8 verse 28, that well-known verse in Romans. And we know that in how many things? All things God works for. The good sometimes, only when we are good. No, 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 no. When God, that God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. Now just for clarity's sake, this goodness does not mean your bank account will be full of gold when you go there tomorrow morning. That's not what it has in mind. This goodness is your spiritual good to become more and more like Jesus Christ. That's the only good that counts in the eyes of God. But what we should not miss here, what James is trying to tell his readers is this, is that God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. He's not good one day and then, oh, this guy has done something wrong, so let me lay out a temptation or something to teach him a lesson along the way or something like that. God is not good one day and bad the other day. 
Now that was something that the, the, the Jews who fled from Jerusalem, even the, they who stayed there, would have been well, it would have been a well-known thing for them to know how the pagans and their religions work. I mean, the pagans' gods were like that. Oh, they killed each other. They stole from one another. They lied to each other. One day they were good and the other day they were bad. So that's why they had to bring all these offerings to just somehow appease them and hope that they will get something of the good of these so-called gods. God is not like that. Everything that flows from Him is for our good, including trials. How do we know? I can just see those readers that James wrote this letter to and say, Yeah, James, how do we know that? Here is how we know. He is the Father of the heavenly lights. James is referring to God as creator. God made the heavenly bodies and every time he made something, he said it was good. God made creation to be good and he made creation to be good for us so that we can enjoy it for his glory, for his sake. So that we can have food to eat, like I've said earlier on, when we sang, before we sang that one song. So that we can have night and day and rest so there can be seasons and we can plant things in one season and harvest it in the next and so on. He is the father of the heavenly lights. That is an external sign of his goodness. Psalm 136 connects this goodness of God with him being the creator of the heavenly bodies. I'm not going to read the whole psalm, but listen to this. It starts like this. Give thanks to the Lord. For what? Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. And then the psalmist explains how we experience His goodness. Now, they, they are, for, for the Jews, there were so many things, but this is the, the place where he started. To Him who alone does great wonders, who by His understanding made the heavens, who spread out the earth upon the waters, who made the great light. Now you know why He calls Him the Father of the heavenly lights. Who made the great lights, the sun to govern the day, the moon and stars to govern the night. In other words, if you want to see externally God's goodness, just look around you and see what He has made. It is evident in His creation. He is the Father of the heavenly lights. It flowed from Him. In a sense, He fathered it. God's goodness is evident there. And... As we've said earlier on, he cannot change. There's simply no shadow of turning with him, James says. Because of the movement of the earth, and you know that the earth turns around, around its own axis, we have night and day, but we also have shadows. And you will know that shadows are never fixed because of this movement of the earth. They, they don't stay in one place. They always change and move. Not so with God. He never changes. His goodness never changes. He is as steadfast as the heavenly bodies, so he never sends bad gifts in his dealings with his children. Hebrews 13 verse 7, the Hebrew writer confirms this. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. If he is good, his goodness cannot become bad. His goodness will be there forever. His Everything that flows from him flows from him who is good. So do not be deceived by this. Do not be deceived by God's role in your trials. He doesn't have your bad... He doesn't have... His intention is not to have you do bad things. To sin. His intention is for you to experience his good. And to make you more and more good. Like his son Jesus Christ in his sight. Do not be deceived to think any otherwise. Here's the last thing that we should take note of. When we are under trials and we are tempted 
to look at God and make Him the culprit for our situations. Verse 18. Remind yourself of the new birth that you have received. This is verse 18. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all He created. Not just is God the Father of the universe, of the lights, but God is also the Father of His children. You will know John 1 verse 12 and 13, Yet to all who did receive Him, to those who believe in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. One of the outstanding examples of God, God's good gifts is that He gives new birth to those whom He loved before the creation of the world. There is an, there is an external testimony to His goodness that we can ob observe in nature, but there's also an internal testimony to His goodness. The new birth that we have experienced to be born into his family and he being our father that's how we are born into his family this is another argument from james to show that god only extends goodness towards his children and not evil or temptation or sin it is significant that james draws our attention to the fact that god chose to give the new birth to those whom he had loved before the creation of this world in other words, this goodness that comes to us is not because we have done some good things. It's not because we keep the law well. God is not coerced into this. This goodness is not worked for. If that was the case, if any of these were true, then it was a, it's not a good gift at all. And we cannot say God is good when we have to work for, work for some part of it. No, this good gift called the new birth that makes us new and more and more good in the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ is a sovereign choice of God flowing from His perfect love and His holy goodness to those whom He saved. James extends a bit here. How do we get this good gift? Just so in case you don't miss this. How do we get this good gift called the new birth? He says, through His word of truth now that w in word is not a capital w he's referring to the gospel we get that from ephesians 1 verse 13 this is ephesians 1 verse 13 and you also were included in christ when you heard the message of truth the gospel of your salvation when you believed you were marked in him with the seal the promised holy spirit now these people James wrote to had received the word of truth. They had heard the gospel. The gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ who died for their sins and was raised on the third day for their justification. The Holy Spirit gave them a new birth, made them new, made them alive to God. They who were dead in their sins towards God, separated from God and would have stayed then that way forever. He gave them life and they believed and are now, and they were then children of God. Now you may ask, for what reason did God choose to give them this good gift called the new birth? Now, now there are many reasons. The main reason is so that we can be made alive to God. Without the new birth, we will not see God for who He is. We will not see ourselves as sinners who is bound for hell. The Holy Spirit makes us new, makes us alive, so that we can see God, see His salvation in Jesus Christ, and repent and put our faith in Him. But there's a, another reason that James points out for us here. According to James, one of the reasons that God gives us the new birth, and, and we must read it in the context that he's talking to about, uh, talking to with these people, that, that God is good and therefore you cannot point fingers to him when you go through a trial. One of the reasons, according to James, is that they might be a kind of a first fruit 
of all he created. What did he mean by that? At harvest time in Israel, people would bring the first fruits. That's the very first part of the yield. They would bring that to the temple and give it to the Lord as a sacrifice. Now normally the first fruit was seen as a pledge of what was to come. But in this case, it was also an act of faith. Trusting God for what was to come. One of the principles why we give to the Lord when we give to Him financially, any other way, this is one of the principles why we do it. And it's a good indication of what we should give. But let's not go there. This was an act of faith. Trusting God for what was to come. Irrespective of what was to come, they gave Him their first fruit. Trusting Him to provide. And that's actually what it said. Lord, I give you my first fruit, trusting you for the whole harvest. Trusting you for what was to come. They, they did not know how the harvest would turn out at that point in time. Locusts could destroy the, their fields the very next week. So this was a statement of faith in the God who provides. So what does this gift of new birth have to do with temptation? When we go through trials and not pointing the finger at God. What does it have to do with God's goodness in all of this? Now first we need to know that the we, the, if I say we, I'm referring to those whom the Lord has saved. That's what James is saying. He chose to give us birth, us birth, through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruit. He's speaking to believers. The first fruits he is referring to is believers. Now, just like the literal first fruits was a pledge of what was to come, we are a pledge. We who have been saved, we who have experienced the new birth, are a pledge of God of what is to come. A sign of God's goodness and perfection to come to all He had created. That's why we read in the Bible that the whole earth and creation is groaning under sin. There will come a time when the whole of the earth and the heavens will be made new and good again like it was in the beginning. God made the, 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 the vision of first fruits here needs to be understood like this. He made us new. God makes us new. He will make all of creation new and good as in the beginning. We are the first fruits of, an, of a new heavens and a new earth. Where there will be no trials, no temptations, no sorrows, no tears. We, we are a foretaste of what lies ahead for the whole of creation. Being made new and good. So not only did the James point them to the, to the goodness of God in creation, he also points them, pointed them to the goodness of God within them as he gave them the new birth so that they are slowly but surely being transformed into the goodness of Jesus Christ. But he also points them forward to see that God's goodness is there in completion, in perfection. Not just for them, but for all of creation. And the fact that they have experienced this new birth, this being made new by God as His child, is kind of a first fruit, is kind of a pledge that God will do the same for all of creation. We are the first fruits in that sense. So, take note of this. Remind yourselves of that when you are going through trials and are tempted to take things into your own hands and sin or question God or accuse God. God is good. He gives good gifts to His children. One is the new birth and it does not stop there. That is just the beginning. This new birth is a pledge of what good is to come a goodness that we will be, that we will enjoy forever eternally 
being in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, a new heavens and earth that He will give us. All will be made good again. So that's as if James said, look ahead as well. Look at creation. Look at yourselves and what God is doing within you, what He did in you and what He is doing in you. But also look forward. Look what is what we are going to inherit. Look ahead and see what is waiting for you as a believer. Eternal life and a perfectly good heavens and earth with Jesus in His presence. And that is what is at stake. And what should cause you to stop and flee from temptation that only causes the opposite? Death and destruction. So in summary, what was James's advice to believers undergoing trials who were tempted to sin as a, right, uh, as a result? Tempted to point the finger at God in all of this. Verse 13, let's apply that to ourselves. We have to remind ourselves that God does not tempt anyone. In other words, get the right perspective of God, who God is. The first part of verse 14, remind yourself that you are enticed by your own evil desires when tempted. And James gave us a whole layout of how that happens in our minds, in our hearts, going over into our actions. In other words, get the right perspective on who you are. A sinner saved by God's grace, you have to trust, we have to trust in Him completely. Verse 14 and 15, remind yourself of the modus operandi and the terrible end of falling into temptation, which is death. Recognize its evil footprint, recognize how it works, discern its working in your life and its scary end. Verse 16 and 17, remind yourself that God is good in all of this, that He has your spiritual good at heart. Verse 18, remind yourself of the good gift of the new birth that you have received from our good God as His pledge of total perfection and goodness for all of creation. Remind yourself that we can see God's good in what He made. Remind yourself that we can see God's good, you can see God's goodness in how He made you a new person to become more and more like our Lord Jesus Christ. And remind yourself of the good that we will inherit one day, total perfection and goodness in Jesus Christ. There will come a time where we will not struggle with temptation and sin externally and internally and enjoy God forever. This is the good end for those whom God has given the new birth. Verse 19, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. So far, God's word. Let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your amazing grace. Thank you, Lord, that when we read these things, we see ourselves, we see how we are enticed by the beauty of this world or the so-called beauty of this world. We see how we are carried away easily by what this world holds out as beautiful and enjoyable. Thank you, Lord, for pointing us again to the terrible end of that. Help us to remember that when we are in such a situation, where we are undergoing a trial, Lord. Give us strength by your grace when we are tempted by these things in this world that are so attractive. Give us discernment, Lord, to to know and see it for what it is and give us your Holy Spirit to remind us of your words, to remind us of who you are, to remind us of your work in us, that you have made us new and that you are busy making us more and more into, into completeness, into maturity to be an acceptable offer to you. Oh, Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that by your grace, you will help blind eyes to see you and lift it up, deaf ears to hear you and to know that salvation 
is to be found in you alone. To know that the first step to deal with all these temptations in, in our trials is a step towards you. So I pray that you will open blind eyes to take that first step of faith and put their trust in you and be saved. Thank you, Father, that we can ask these things. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your word that we can come back to you again and again and find your path, your guidance there that we need so much in this world that is so confused and so full of darkness. I pray that you will give us a constant mindset to live your words in our lives. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.